Hello everyone, welcome to the last video in homeostasis and I'm sure for you it has been a very long journey. This is one of, one of the really long chapters in biology um, and it is followed by coordination which is an equally long chapter uh, but it's just good to be at the end. If you haven't watched the videos on homeostasis and you want to understand how the kidneys make urine and regulate um, the amount of water in the body, how blood glucose concentration is um, controlled as well as temperature, please make sure you check them out. This is the last video for this chapter. Uh, usually I find that students find anything that has to do with plants very discouraging, but I'd just like to tell you that it's not difficult. It's very straightforward, very easy. And these sections are usually just short sections of very long chapters. So don't be discouraged by this. Please make sure you watch it as well and you understand how plants also conduct homeostasis. So I think the very first question here is that students usually say, well, why do plants need homeostasis? Well, first of all, plants are alive. They are living organisms. They carry out metabolic functions. They carry out transport functions. Um, they're not alive in the sense that they can walk, but you know, who knows? We don't know if that will happen someday soon. Uh, but plants do need to regulate the amount of gases that enter and leave their cells. So the amount of CO2 that enter and leave, for example, is something important that plants must control. They control the entry and exit of um, carbon dioxide in the leaves, and they do that through um, structures called the stomata. The stomata are like tiny openings that are surrounded by guard cells. So I'm just using a red pen to circle it over there, surrounded by guard cells, and these guard cells can sort of determine whether or not the stomata will open. The stomata also open to control the amount of CO2. Like I said earlier, they respond to increasing light intensity. So when light intensity is high, the stomata are likely to open. When low CO2 concentration is detected in the leaves, the stomata will open in order to allow more CO2 in which means that if, the, if they respond or if they open in response to high light intensity, it means that when there's low light intensity, the stomata will close. So in darkness, the stomata are mostly closed. And that is one of the reasons why we tend to say that the plants are not as active in the dark. When there's high CO2 concentration inside the leaves, the stomata will close. And if you remember from transport in plants, where we discussed transpiration, we also mentioned that things like low humidity high temperature and also the availability of water can affect transpiration and transpiration mostly hope, um, happens through the stomata in the leaves. Okay, so how do the stomata open and close? Remember what I said on the previous slide that the stomata are surrounded by two guard cells and they lose water by osmosis. These are the guard cells. So the stomata just holes and the guard cells are like gates. So think of it as you're trying to open a double door, right? So when you throw, when you swing the two doors open, the space is wide open, anything can flow through. But when you close both doors, then nothing is able to pass through. The way they do this is by um, regulating the amount of protons in the guard cells. It is important for you to also know that when the guard cells are turgid, they gain water, um, they gain water and become turgid and that results in the opening of the stomata and when they um, when they are flaccid and lose water, that results in the closing of the stomata. But I will explain how that happens. So what will happen to the stomata? How do they open or close? First things first, um, the hydrogen protons or the protons in the guard cells are pumped out using proton pumps, okay? And this is active transport. So they are pumped out of the guard cells and that results in a decrease in the concentration of protons inside the guard cells and makes the inside of the guard cells negatively charged. The next thing that then happens is that to balance the charges, because remember, the guard cells have pumped out their protons. So think of it as this is a guard cell and then it pumps out its proton. Let's say it's pumped out protons over here, you know protons are positively charged. What that, what that then causes is that the outside becomes more positive than the inside of the guard cell itself. Okay, So in order to balance the charges, these protons, um, there needs to be an inflow of positive charge. It doesn't have to be the protons. So the channel proteins that are on the membrane over here, channel proteins that are on the membranes will then open so that potassium ions can flow into the cell. And if you remember correctly, potassium ions and protons carry the same amount of charge. 
um, protons are H plus, potassium is K plus. So basically we're balancing the charge. We're not balancing protons in particular, but balancing the charge inside of the guard cells. So the channel proteins will open and potassium ions will then flow into the guard cell. When potassium ions start to flow in, they result in a reduction of water potential. So it's like the potassium ions, if you remember from the kidney story, um, they reduce water potential by just being there inside the guard cell, uh, which means they make the inside more concentrated. And as a result of this, water will move into the guard cells and as they move into the guard cells they make the guard cells more turgid and that opens the stomata once the proton pumps stop pumping protons out of the cell the potassium ions will move out the water will leave the guard cells the cells become flaccid and therefore they close the stomata which means that in order for the stomata to be open the guard cells must be um, turgid which means they must take in water and for them to take in water it involves the use of the proton pumps and the influx of potassium now besides regulating how much co2 goes in or out and things like that plants also regulate the amount of water that they lose if you remember from chapter seven where we discussed xerophytes we spoke about how xerophytes are these specially adapted plants that are able to survive in areas of water stress without dying which is very unusual for most plants this is because xerophytes most likely have an increased concentration of an of a hormone called abscisic acid also called aba ABA is able to stimulate stomatal closure. It is considered a stress hormone. And whenever plants are exposed to stressful environments, the concentration of ABA is said to increase. Now, the mode of action of ABA itself is unknown. Um, it's not sure of how this hormone reacts particularly. But it is believed that ABA is sometimes able to bind to receptors on the surface of the guard cell membranes. And what it then does is that it inhibits the proton pumps from pumping out um, protons. And if there is no pump out of protons, then there'll be no need to balance charge inside of the, um, of the guard cell. And so that means that there's no influx of potassium ions. And that means that there's no uptake of water. So the guard cells remain flaccid and through that they're able to keep the stomata closed and able to save water or reduce the rate of transpiration so i'm just going to say that again so that it's clear aba it's not sure or there is no sure pathway according to your syllabus that um, sort of tells us what happens with aba but it is believed that aba can possibly bind to receptors on the cell membranes of the guard cells and by binding to these receptors it inhibits the actions of the proton pumps so remember we said that for the guard cells to become turgid and open the stomata the proton pumps must pump out protons and in order to balance that potassium ions must flow in and when potassium ions flow in they reduce water potential in the guard cells and as a result of that water would flow into the guard cells and make them turgid resulting in the opening of the stomata now if the proton pumps are inhibited it means that aba is preventing protons from being pumped out protons from being pumped out which means there'll be no need to bring in potassium ions which means there'll be no need to take up water which means that the stomata will remain flaccid and as a result of that prevent the plant from losing water through transpiration so that is what the supposed action of aba is in case you are asked to suggest a mode of action for aba this is it from me for homeostasis this is the very last section the next chapter is coordination and i anticipate that coordination would be about six different videos because it is a long detailed chapter but it is also very interesting because in that you will learn how your um, nervous system functions and the factors that influence the transmission of impulses and things like that. You also learn how your muscles contract. Remember that I am using notes from my classroom. Um, so please, by all means, you can take down these notes. They're very good summaries of the textbook as well. And I hope that you're finding these videos helpful. Don't forget to use the playlist function 
to filter out information for certain chapters. I have arranged all the videos under their chapter titles so that you can simply go and watch for a particular chapter without having to sieve through the entire channel. All the best with the upcoming exams. I hope I can record everything before then, but I hope that if I don't, you are well prepared. Until the next video, have a good time. Goodbye.